So, just to warn you, my uh, presentation includes uh, sex, um, it includes violence, um, it includes profanity, and it also includes occasional loud noises. So those of a sensitive uh, disposition, um, I hope it's uh, not too alarming for you. Um, we'll also be doing um, an experiment uh, in the room, which you'll be helping me with, and I'll also be getting you to um, apply some of what hopefully you'll be um, learning and taking in from uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today. So, uh, yeah, I'm Rob Hubbard, so uh, my company's LAS. Uh, we design all kinds of uh, sort of digital uh, products. Um, the, probably the most important thing about me is I've, I've always been a designer, so um, I've studied design, I've worked as a physical designer, an automotive design engineer, I studied third world engineering design, um, I've been a, um, you know, worked as a graphic designer, web designer, instructional designer, um, and I'm really interested in what I can take from um, various other disciplines and use in the, in the stuff that I design and that our, our company designs. So today we're talking about memory and attention, um, which is uh, obviously very key to, to learning. And there's loads of other stuff that I'm very interested in, like um, evolutionary psychology, for example, and human behavior and habit forming, all of this, all this kind of stuff. But today we're focusing on, uh, on memory. So we mentioned that there's a, an elephant in the title, there's an elephant in the room. I think we're all pretty well aware of the elephant, but generally they don't get uh, uh, their kind of due until they are actually sitting on somebody like poor, poor Alan here. But I think this elephant has, to, to mangle my metaphors terribly, has come home to roost uh, now. So uh, brace yourselves, everybody. This next slide is absolutely terrifying. Oh, no, it's not that. It's the one after. <laughs> God, I should have kept my powder dry. So this is Herman. This is our elephant in the room. Um, so his name's Herman. Uh, he's an elephant. And this session is to do with memory. Uh, what do you think I might be referring to? Who, who or what? Anybody got any ideas? Just shout out. No? OK. All right, this next slide is the terrifying slide. There you go. So that, that sound effect there, that was a composite of the screams from every person that's tried to teach uh, people, every lecturer, every teacher, every L&D professional for the last 100 years. Because we've known about this stuff for over 100 years. I'm sure you've seen the forgetting curve before. Um, I find it absolutely hilarious that as an industry, we actively forget about the forgetting curve, which is just, just brilliant. Um, <laughs> So obviously, there's things that we can do to, to reduce the rate that people forget. And Herman Ebbinghaus, if you don't know, he's the guy who did the initial set of experiments on himself uh, trying to remember nonsense syllables, so completely unrelated uh, sounds. And he would um, try and learn these. And then at various time intervals after, he would test himself. And he would measure the rate at which he was forgetting. Um, now, this, of course, is you know, you couldn't say that the stuff that you're teaching is always completely unrelated to what people know. So this is why we have the kind of the, the green, green curves here. So normally there are some things that we can do to help people remember. But this is a, it's a good kind of aid memoir. I mean, uh, numerous other studies have been done that have demonstrated that there is a, a very rapid rate of forgetting. And all of us, as humans, know this is true. So, you know, how much detail can you remember from the presentations that you've seen, even just over the last few days, or even the, the one that you went to before this? It very, very rapidly goes. Um, but there are things that we can do that will, uh, that will combat against that. So, um, you can't talk about memory without busting some myths. So, you have to do this. It's in the rule book. Um, Dr. Julia Shaw is in the main theatre at the moment, who knows an absolute ton about memory and has written loads of great books on the subject, very interesting speaker. Um, and her angle tends to be more, you know, what can you do as an individual to improve your memory? My focus here is what can we do as L&D professionals trying to de design solutions for our audience that make the most of memory rather than kind of acting against it. So I picked out some of the myths. There's lots of myths which have been kind of debunked uh, over the years as we can carry out more uh, accurate kind of studies into how the brain works. But I picked out um, three here, I think there's three, um, that are most kind of relevant to us. So one of the things that people um, used to think was that memory was like a video recording. So that your experiences would come in through your senses, through your eyes and your ears and, uh, and, and your other senses, and would be kind of recorded sequentially within your, 
this, this lovely uh, hard disk that you've got in your mind, and then remembering was simply a, a matter of kind of scrubbing back to that point and then playing it forward, and it would come out exactly as it was recorded. Um, this is absolutely not true um, at all. So uh, what has a really huge effect is the, the emotions that we're experiencing at the time of, of uh, you know, taking in this information, and also our biases. So this is, this is really interesting. So um, stuff which aligns with our belief and our views of the world, we will pay more attention to. And because we pay more attention to it, we're more likely to remember it. So I get lots of um, uh, you know, uh, it, news feeds from The Independent uh, in my um, Facebook, because that kind of aligns with my, with my views. Whereas stuff which goes against that, I will find it very difficult to pay attention to, and I will kind of put it, put it to one side. So, you know, for example, um, Donald Trump, I think he is a very dangerous uh, fascist megalomaniac man-child. So <laughs> when, I, when I see evidence of him doing good, I find it very difficult to pay attention to that, and that won't stick in my head. But when I get all of these news feeds from, uh, you know, the Independent saying all these terrible and unfortunately true things about Donald Trump, they, they stick in my head because they remind me that, yeah, I'm, I'm right, you know. Very, uh, very interesting. So this means that if you're trying to train people and get them to remember stuff, which is a big leap for them and goes against stuff they, they believe in, against their values, it's even harder to get them to remember it. Um, so memories don't change over time. So this is some of Herman the Elephant's um, relatives here. Uh, he commissioned this carving from a friend of his, an ocelot. So absolutely beautiful job of it. Um, but unfortunately, memories do uh, change over time. Um, and actually, the act of recalling a memory changes it. So this is really interesting. So in the same way that um, when you take in data, um, you will pay more attention to things that kind of align with your views and ignore things that don't. In the same way, when you recall a memory, it's like it's remixing all of this kind of information. And it's like a kind of sycophant DJ that's desperate to please and desperate to paint you in the best possible light. So for example, on a night out, it will remind you of that uh, wonderful uh, joke that you told at the start that had all of your friends like rolling around laughing and slapping their thighs with mirth. mirth. It will um, actively uh, kind of forget about and blur out the bit later on when you were dancing on the table and you took your trousers off. So it will always try and paint you in a more kind of positive light. So uh, another, another useful one uh, for us. Um, and that forgetting happens slowly. Well, it actually it, it happens very, very quickly. I mean, as we've seen from Ebbinghaus's curves, that is an extreme uh, example. Um, but it does happen very, very quickly. Uh, but there are some things that we can do to, to work against that. And we'll be sharing some, uh, some principles and thinking about that in a minute. So this is our memory experiment. Um, you are all subjects of the experiment, and you don't get a choice. So um, what I'd like you to do now is spend a minute uh, looking at these 10 words, 10 just pretty much random words. You're not allowed to write them down. Just look at them for one minute and do your best to remember them. OK, time's up. So what I'd like you to do now is just on a bit of paper or whatever you've got, write down as many of those words as you can remember. So now I want you to mark how you did. So I'll, I'll read these out because it will save you having to ping pong back and forth. Uh, which, um, if this bit of the video, I like, can we just have an edit of this video? So just this next bit where I read out 10 random words. I think that would be brilliant just to post on uh, YouTube. Um, and tick off the ones you've got uh, and just tot up the ones you've got correct. So baboon. Oop. Cucumber. Apple. Table. Calendar. Wednesday. Cake, Venus, umbrella, and shoe. So have you all got your, your marks? You know how many you've got out of 10, yeah? OK. Um, so let's, let's find out. So my um, short-term memory, this short-term memory experiment, is uh, not very good. So uh, fact, shall I tell you this? No, let's, let's uh, get your results first. So put your hand up if you only got one correct. OK, that's fine. Two. Who got two correct? So you got one and two correct. It's not a <laughs> you got two, two correct. Three. Four. Five. Six. 
Uh -huh. Seven. Quite a few sevens. Eight. Very good. Nine. Awesome. Ten. Some tens as well. Fantastic. So you've probably heard this kind of seven uh, plus or minus two thing, which some people think is uh, five plus or minus two. Personally, I can remember like four things. Um, so those who remembered uh, nine or ten, how did you do that? Did you use a particular technique? What, what did you go through in your mind to memorize? So just uh, share high. Very good. Um, Wednesday is part of the calendar. <laughs> yeah. Um, umbrella and shoe you can use. Very good. Um, <laughs> Venus obviously is a, a planet, but also the um, love god. Yeah. So just things that you can actually collect, you know, collective. Yeah. So you've grouped them together. You've yeah. also made some meaning of them. Did other yeah. people use similar kind of <laughs> techniques? So just uh, the gentleman, gentleman at the back there, please. Hello. Yeah, mm. I just got, uh, I suppose it was stories, really. So my shoes got wet on Very Wednesday, good. which is then the calendar. Yeah. And uh, uh, the baboon was eating a cucumber uh -huh. and an apple, so it sort of created stories, really. Yeah, yeah, very good. So, I mean, as we saw in our keynote this morning, you've made, made sense of that with the story, and we're predisposed. You've been passing down knowledge for thousands of years. As soon as we could really have language, we use stories to, to learn from. So it's interesting. You've all, th those that have scored more highly, you've, you've made sense of it. The, the seven plus or minus two thing as well, that doesn't have to be seven individual bits of information, like seven words. Um, you can chunk it together. So it's kind of seven, seven chunks, potentially. Um, so that's great. So you've, you've kind of confirmed this seven plus or minus two. Personally, four is about my limit. So if I have to go to the shop and uh, my wife tells me, she gives me like four things to get from the shop, I'm going to forget one of them. There's absolutely no chance. And I'll be walking to the shop reciting them. I'll get to the shop and we'll have forgotten something. Very good. Thank you for taking the time to do that. So um, what do we pay attention to and what, what will we remember? So uh, this is the three Fs. Um, and it is actually called the three Fs, yeah. Uh, so we, we pay particular attention to these things. So um, food, so stuff that provides sustenance to us, um, stuff that nourishes us, makes us healthy, makes us strong. We, we pay great attention to, to that, and we are uh, more likely to remember those things favorably. It makes sense when you think of us uh, evolving and uh, uh, kind of you know, running around on the plains and hunter-gathering. If we eat some berries and they make us violently sick, it's quite important for us to kind of remember that. Equally, if we eat some other berries and they're absolutely delicious and give us loads of energy and loads of sugar, we want to remember that too. Uh, fight, so stuff which is a physical threat to us, danger to us, uh, we, will, we will remember, it will stick in our heads. So for example, if I was to tell you that uh, my colleague is outside that door now and the first person who tries to leave early now, she's going to punch you in the face, <laughs> you'll, you'll probably remember that. So, uh, and the final F is, of course, uh, procreation. So stuff to do with uh, kind of sex and reproduction, stuff that will help us uh, kind of continue our, our gene down through the ages we, uh, we pay attention to. So has anybody been in a training experience that's combined all three of these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that's kind of nub of the problem, isn't it, really? Um, most training's, like, really boring. If that's the interesting stuff, it's really, this is what it is. It's just like, oh my God, have, have we got to do this? So how can we make it interesting? That's our jobs after all. It's what we get up in the morning every day and we try to do. So what are the things that we can do? Well, there is, there is stuff. So it doesn't have to be all about sex and violence. Um, you can make things uh, interesting apart from, in, in other ways. So the really obvious thing is make it relevant so that people can, um, you know, if it's something that they need and that they seek out and it's helping them solve a problem, um, then that is immediately, you've got their attention. You're not trying to force it on them. So this pushes you away from one size fits all kind of generic approaches and much more towards kind of tailored, personalized learning experiences. Uh, make it emotive. So we are, we're social animals. We're not particularly strong or fast or fierce. We don't have, uh, you know, weapons or, uh, you know, talons or, or teeth. Um, but we're very good socially when we collaborate with one another. And one of the ways, the kind of social currency that we use is through emotion and, and empathy and understanding one another. And 
Um, so if you're able to, to uh, bring emotion into your learning, uh, possibly in the form of a story, uh, then that, that will really, really help. Uh, make it unusual, make it stand out from all the other stuff. I mean, it's, so, it's such an obvious thing, really, isn't it? Um, but you, you often have these uh, clashes with the, your corporate brand police. That may have been what that snigger was about. Who, that, you know, their mission is to make everything all look the same, and our mission is to make everything look different. <laughs> and there, therein lies some interesting conversations. Um, but you can usually win them by saying, you know, what do you think is more memorable? Stuff that all looks the same, or where there is something that is actually different. Um, so, competitive and collaborative, I'm very interested in um, these kind of basic uh, human traits, so these things that have helped us get to this stage here, sat in a conference room wearing clothes and tapping on tablets. Um, things like competition, we compete against those who aren't like us. We also compete in friendly ways with people who are like us. Um, we like to collaborate as well, quite often. Uh, it's quite interesting. It's, um, Actually, let's do a quick, a quick sort of poll. Um, who here would say they were a competitive person? Yeah. And those of you who said you're competitive, um, well, who here would say they're a collaborative person? And who here would say they were both, fairly evenly? Yeah, that's quite interesting, really. Because I'm, I'm more collaborative than competitive. So I play sports, I enjoy sports, but I just like to have a good game. You know, I like to play tennis. I get beaten pretty much every tennis match I have. So long as I feel like I'm improving, that's, that's fine. I'm, I think I'm perhaps more of a collaborator. Yeah, and that wasn't part of the presentation. I was just interested in it. Uh, <laughs> I've got a room full of uh, interesting people. I'm going to ask you questions. Um, and try, you know, try and make it fun. You know, it doesn't have to be all like, dead serious and corporate and everything. It can actually be, be fun and, and enjoyable. So. Um, you're probably aware of this already, really. I'm sort of teaching you to suck eggs a little bit. But just to highlight the fact that we all have these wonderful um, extended brains now. Um, so these things are your gateway to all of the uh, data and information on the internet and on your company platforms and systems and so forth. You know, use your brain for what it's really good at. So we are fantastic uh, uh, at pattern recognition. So we're very, very good at looking at a cloud and seeing a duck or a dragon or taking an idea from over here and then applying it somewhere completely different over here. But what we've seen, in just in this presentation, and what we all appreciate as individuals, is we're not a VCR recorder, we're not a hard disk, we're not good at recording loads of information, <coughs> recalling it accurately, uh, but these things are, and what they give us gateways to are. So absolutely, make, make the most of those. So what we're gonna do now is, um, I'll take you through some principles and um, then we're going to get you to apply some of these and see what kind of solutions you come up with. So I'll go through the principles first of all and I'll explain what, what we're going to do. Um, so it doesn't come up quite so well. Um, so top left there, the obvious thing, really obvious, minimize the stuff you want them to remember. Um, because it's really difficult to remember stuff, so don't just give them tons of information. Maximize what they can look up when needed. So put that places that they can, they can access and get to easily. Um, help them make meaning of something when they first learn it. So exactly as our high scoring people in the experiment did, generally a lot of you that did well in the, the nines and tens, you made meaning of those words. So by the act of making meaning of something, we connect it to um, other concepts, pre-existing knowledge, other experiences that we've had. And the more of those kind of mental hooks that we can create, the more likely we are to retain something. Um, so evoke emotions and try to make it resonate with people. So try to get some level of uh, emotion in there, which might be through um, considering the impacts of the, uh, um, you know, to the individual of happening. In fact, I've told this story a few times, but not, not in a while. So years ago, I was asked to um, design a uh, anti-money laundering um, course, e-learning course, and we were meeting with the sort of bank bigwigs and. Uh, they said, uh, you know, we really we need, to be, need to be hot on this anti-money laundering. We've had a wrist slap a couple of times, a bit of an issue for us. And I said, fantastic, I think we can do some really good stuff here. So um, why don't we base it around a story? So how about um, there's a young girl and she's uh, trafficked into the country. Um, she's uh, forced into prostitution. She's kept more or less in, imprisoned uh, by her pimp. Uh, the money that he makes from exploiting her, um, he puts into uh, one of your bank accounts. Um, which he's been able to set up because the, the Know Your Customer checks haven't been done. And they're all sat around the table like, whoa, um, yeah, 
maybe not. We, we, we might upset somebody with that. It's like, well, that is what happens in the real world, isn't it? You know, it wouldn't take much Googling to find an example on the news where exactly that thing has happened, you know. And if the people going through this, instead of it being, oh, it's another bit of bloody compliance, for Christ's sake, on know your customer, oh, God. But if they think through, it's actually affecting what happens to real human beings, vulnerable human beings. That's why this stuff is so important. They're much more likely to take notice of it and try and, try and uh, remember it and, and use it. Um, so, yeah, make it, make it novel and different. Try and make things kind of stand out. That doesn't mean everything needs to be kind of wacky and crazy, but try and have a particular sort of angle or aspect of what you're doing that just sets it apart a little bit, makes it a little bit different. Um, and space repetition, so um, meaningful space repetition, so not the parrot repeating of, you know, the way that we used to learn our times tables, for example. Or my son, it's really interesting now, when he's do learning his uh, spellings, you know, he used to get the here's all the words you want you to learn, there's a column for each of the days, and then you cover them, and then you just repeat them and do them that. Now they get booklets where the first thing they do is just write them down, they just copy them down. The next thing they do is they fill in the blank using those words in sentences. Then the third thing they do is they make up sentences of their own using those words in the right context, and then, and then they do the more traditional spelling practice. So they're getting the kids to make meaning of what they're learning. They're, they're increasing those kind of uh, hooks to uh, what they already know. So those are our kind of six principles, and there, there's more. But th these are the, uh, yeah, some of the key ones which I use and which we use as, a, as an organization. So what I'd like you to do now is make meaning of what I've been talking to you about. So um, in kind of groups, so if you sat on your own, please move and chat to some other people. But let's take a, uh, something we're all familiar with, health and safety training. So health and safety training. If you were to reimagine some health and safety training that people had to do, using these principles, what kinds of learning interventions would you come up with? You don't have to use all six, you might just focus on a particular principle, but I'd like you just in tables for a few minutes, just generate some ideas, then we want to feed them back. Uh, I'll get you to shout them out and feed them back. We'll see if any patterns are emerging. So I'm just going to give you a few minutes to do that. So what we'd like to do is just start hearing back some of the things that you've come up with and see if there's any patterns emerging to the kinds of ideas that you've had. So, uh, who would like to start? Who would like to share? And like, um, what was it? Miles said yesterday, I am a father, so I will pick on people. <laughs> um, we've actually realised that maybe this isn't very safe, but we thought, um, it may be in a warehouse environment, and you could give your warehouse staff um, an iPad, and they could have 10 minutes, um, like, training session, um, to wander around looking at their iPad, not safe, um, and then hazards could pop up on the iPad screen. They're, they're seeing the exact environment on their iPad screen, so like AR uh -huh. um, hazards are popping up, like Pokemons, and they're like, oh, you know, there's a hazard, spillage yep. perhaps, and then they get immediate feedback, or if they've missed something, then, you know, it would flash up, you've just missed something, whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's immediate and it's real. It's short. Sounds great. It's Next year, they could trip. get a stand downstairs with that. <laughs> Love it. Brilliant. Um, who, who else? What other ideas have we had? Oh, yeah, we'll come to you after. Thank you. Uh, we, we thought of combining a few of them and taking into account what you mentioned there about the, the example you gave about the bank and the storytelling. Hmm. We thought we could take some aspect of health and safety, like manual lifting and start with the, um, somebody at home, they've been off work for X amount of months because they've damaged the back because they haven't lifted correctly, mm. the impact that's having on their life um, because their sick pay has stopped, uh, all because they didn't lift correctly, and then going into what could have happened had yeah. they lifted correctly, um, maximising that with information about if you don't lift correctly, this is what happens to your, your muscles and your ligaments and your back or your, your bones, etc. Yeah. if they want to go into a deeper dive of it. Um, and what else did we say? I think that was about it. Okay, <laughs> brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think there was the, the lady over here, please, Sheena. So the further apart you can be, the better. We'll get, we'll get our money's worth out of Sheena. So I'm looking for somebody in that corner next. <laughs> there. Um, we didn't necessarily come up with the how, um, but what we thought was um, for health and safety, it needed to really be the evoke emotions and make meaning. So yeah. 
Um, we all explained that most of our health and safety training had war, um, fires. It, I mean, we, we used one in an oven in a bakery. Yeah. I work in an office, and it's making that connection. Yeah. So um, actually the, it making it real and making meaning and relevant to the area that you're in and Absolutely. having that emotional attachment to it. Yeah, so it's amazing how, um, you know, to us as learning designers, it's like, why can't they, it's just the same. It's, in a, it's, a, it's a fire and it's the same, even though it's in a bakery. But all of the, the learners look at it and go, I don't work in a bloody bakery. What's that got to do with me? <laughs> you know, and that, that is a barrier to them and, and it's much more difficult for them to remember that. So, excellent. Um, so, I think there was a lady in the far corner there, <laughs> Sheena. And then I think there'll probably be one uh, over there. <laughs> Doing it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Shortest person in the room. <laughs> Littlest legs. Um, yeah, we talked about making it personal um, yeah. and then so telling stories. And even though I don't think any of us worked on a building site, we picked that as a, as a place of work. And we said you could, um, if you use sort of a cartoon type theme, you could mm. then, if someone didn't wear their hard hat or anything like that, they could fall off a scaffold and mm. sort of turn it into the roadrunner yeah, type yeah. thing as well. Bit so it kind of makes it, it sets it apart, but yeah. also you could link to it, you could see it happening without yeah. it being a real person. Consequences. Yes, consequences. And the consequences, <laughs> absolutely. Brilliant. So, I mean, as you can see, just in a kind of five-minute activity, the stuff that you're generating based on these principles, which make the most of people's memory and attention, they're sounding pretty cool, aren't they? They're sounding pretty, <laughs> pretty engaging. You know, I'd, I'd certainly much rather do that than some traditional uh, health and safety. So um, I think we've probably run... She, she's raising her eyebrows at me now. Um, and just before, before we started... When I came in the room to meet Sheena, I said, I should warn you, Sheena, my presentation, it, it involves, there is some sex, there is some violence, there's some profanity, there's, there's going to be screaming as well. And she was like, thank you for telling me <laughs> at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, Sheena, that's it. You can sit down. I, I won't uh, bother you anymore. Um, so the kinds of things that we have been coming up with, they involve these sorts of elements. So what I wanted you to kind of notice that based on those principles coming up with these approaches, you're not actually having to learn to do anything new. This is all the stuff you do already. So you already have lots of documents, you already create animations, uh, infographics, you shoot video, you have diagrams, you do scenarios and simple simulations and games. And it's all the stuff that you do. It's just kind of using it in a slightly different way. Um, and, and the the cool thing is then, of course, that you don't need, uh, you don't need any kind of uh, different tools to do that. So, I mean, it does, it does push us more towards uh, performance support. So we're trying to close the learning gap, you know, so that we have the minimum of that uh, forgetting curve kicks in as possible. We're trying to move the learning to the point of need. Um, and the, the thing I really like about performance support, and it's not a solution for everything, um, is that it really works with the way the memory works and attention works. So first of all, I'm going to find this thing because I've got a problem to solve. So immediately, it's got my attention. So that is the, the number one challenge. Generally, we're trying to push stuff at people and convince them they need to invest an hour of their really busy life learning about something which isn't relevant to them. This has completely got rid of that. They've gone there because they need it. So they'll then go through the, they'll go through the content. It will be practical. It will help them actually start to apply this stuff. And by applying it, they're making meaning of it. And they're linking it to what they already know, what they need to do. They're trying it out. They're getting it slightly wrong. They're trying it again. Um, and then the patterns of use that you should have for performance support is the first time they will use quite a lot of support from that particular resource, first time they're doing that task. The second time, they'll remember a bit more of it. They'll come back and have a little reminder. Third and fourth, you see we're getting our spaced repetition in there as well, where they're making meaning of it too. So I th that's why I think performance support, although this is you know, memory and elephants and all that in the performance support track, that was why I wanted to bring that in, because these are the forms of learning which I think fit it quite well. And micro-learning, of course, you know, little, little bites of things, smaller versions of what you're doing now. So um, quite a lot of organizations have these great big um, you know, kind of chunks of e-learning, these sort of hour-long, 40-minute-long type things. There's a real easy win here. Just break it apart. Break them apart into the little bits. You know, there's a quiz, little quiz, there's an animation, there's some uh, bits that you can read, there's a little interaction, and then assemble them in different sequences for different purposes. So imagine taking all of those and assembling them based around the tasks 
that particular individuals in particular roles need to do. So instead of having to plough through 40 minutes of e-learning, of which five minutes of it might be useful to them, instead they can go to an intranet page, I need to do, that's the task I need to do, brilliant. And then it gives them just exactly what they need. And it's recycled and reused from what you've already got. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, the tools that you need to produce this stuff, it's the tools you're already using. It's what you've already got. You don't have to buy a fancy new bit of software or try anything new. You know, these are the, the pretty standard uh, digital learning production tools. So, yeah, all the slides will be, uh, be going up. But, yeah, take, take pictures if you want to, by all means. So um, that was it, really. So what I hope you got there was that a few things to hopefully remember about memory, if, if you can. Uh, we tried to make some meaning of the stuff that you learned in the exercises. We did that little experiment and learned a bit about short-term memory and, uh, and long-term memory. So yeah, I hope that's been of useful. And you may hopefully remember just a small fraction of this. Uh, depends how much you go for the free drink. So yeah, thanks very much. If anybody has any questions, I noticed there was a hand floating around there. We're now competing against the free drinks, so this is going to be interesting. Here we go. I just have a quick question. A lot of the, the things I've seen throughout this conference around online performance support has seemed very linear, that yeah. you go to a point and there's a document with information or there's a video. I come from a very interdisciplinary collaborative environment where so much of the learning is, is collaborative feedback, real time, constantly iterating. How do you do that in that sort of environment? We, we use Slack, we use lots of sort of embedded tools yeah. and try to roll it up so that it becomes a dominant FAQ question or things like that. But I, I haven't seen much in the space, in the technology space or in this around, how do you actually create kind of learning communities around this sort of thing that, so you can continue to allow people to self refine and grow mm. um, as a way to kind of highlight challenges that come up in the managerial space. So do you mean with input from their, from their peers, so other people feeding in? Is that what you mean, sort of social? And yeah, learning? exactly. So you know, I, I work mostly with computational biologists, software engineers, web lab scientists, yeah, faculty, yeah. who manage small groups through massive projects yeah. and partnerships. And they all have the same challenges, yeah. but they bring different perspectives. So we yeah, create opportunities yeah. for them to interact. Yeah. So we, we kind of give life to these sort of semi-autonomous groups. Mm. And a lot of that happens in person, but what we're mm. struggling with is how do you then actually create an online apparatus that will continue yeah. to allow them to essentially teach themselves and learn from one another? Yeah. So you know, lunches are great, stuff. but like a, a kind of an online stream. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if there are um, tools around to do this, but certainly something I've been really interested in is just the act of giving thanks. So some, you, you're stuck on something, somebody helps you with it, and there is a way that you publicly give thanks to them, so it's kind of reward and, and recognition. And then being able to kind of capture what that was given for. Um, I mean, I suppose it depends how people are um, distributed, but you know, video is a really nice way to kind of capture stuff, just quite conversationally. It doesn't need to be um, you know, amazing production values, because you know, you're hearing really useful stuff from someone like you who solved the problem that you need to solve. So I think it's, pr it's probably around I don't think there's an easy way. I think it is the curation route, which it sounds like you're, you're taking, finding those good examples um, where a, a question has been answered, a solution's been given, and trying to capture those in a meaningful way for people, but also giving them a way that they can give thanks for that. Because the more people see other people you know, kind of getting recognition for a behavior, the more likely people are to want to do that as well. I mean, we did a platform uh, years ago for um, a big, uh, uh, like, uh, oil and gas company and uh, one of the things so the site is a big collaboration site and you could because of the rules in Germany about keeping all the data secure and stuff like that you could use the site just as an individual nobody else would see you so that was the basic level of privacy you could tick a box to say um, I'm I'm prepared for people to see my contact details you could tick a further box to say uh, people can see my contact details and my levels of experience and then the fourth box, and it was like a hierarchy, was, and I'm prepared to help others. And what that did was it put a little icon, a little happy to help sort of icon over their profile picture. And what we found was, you know, when people were searching for each other, because it was kind of LinkedIn crossed with uh, Pinterest sort of thing, and they'd get all the search results, or, or they'd, look, they'd look and see their picture. There's all these other pictures with all these people happy to help, and there's just a handful that aren't. They're encouraged to be happy to help as well. So you can make use of those kind of 
uh, sort of social levers um, to do things. But it, sa it sounds like you're doing it right, yeah. All right, brilliant. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for sticking to the bitter end. Thank you. <laughs>